Welcome back, chemists. In this lesson, we're going to look at resonance contributors. Uh, resonance is a way of showing two different representations, or more than two representations, of a given structure, where the only thing that's changed is the placement of the electrons. For instance, I have two representations of the diazomethane molecule in front of you, and it says which one is correct. Well, actually, both are correct, uh, because the true structure, the actual structure, is a hybrid of both of these. The only thing that's different is the placement of pi electrons and lone pair electrons. It's the only thing that changes when you look at different resonance contributors. We normally think of electrons in pairs as capable of being shared by two atoms, but the key to resonance is that they might be shared among more than two atoms. They are delocalized among more than two atoms in a molecule. And we represent that by showing a double-headed arrow between multiple contributors. This is not an equilibrium arrow. This is not a double reversible reaction arrow because these are not interconverting. They're different representations of one thing. The true thing is a hybrid, and it might look more like one of the contributors than the other, and we'll come back to that. But this is just our best way of representing how the electrons are not localized between only two atoms at a time. We also show how that electron delocalization works by using a curved arrow. A curved arrow in organic chemistry means two electrons. It always implies a pair of electrons. And we use that to show how a lone pair becomes a shared pair, or vice versa, or a shared pair becomes a different shared pair. For example, I see that this double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen becomes only a single bond, and one of those pairs of electrons ends up on the carbon atom itself. And I can show that by drawing a curved arrow from where the electrons came from to where they end up going to. In this case, from the bond directly to the carbon atom, right next to it. That little arrow right there means that pair of electrons that's forming the pi bond is no longer there and now exists on top of the carbon atom as a lone pair. So we use this to show how one contributor sort of becomes another. But remember, the true structure is actually a hybrid of both as one thing. The electrons are just delocalized and spread around. It's not that it's wavering back and forth between these two. That's not the only curved arrow I would use for this contributor, though. There's another change. The double bond between the nitrogens uh, is now a triple bond in the contributor on the right. And one of the lone pairs is no longer on the nitrogen. It actually became that extra shared pair. So I show that with a curved arrow as well. And I draw it from one of the lone pairs to directly between the nitrogen atoms. That communicates that this lone pair is no longer unshared, it's now shared between the nitrogen atoms. And that's the beginning of what's called a curved arrow formalism, showing how electrons uh, delocalize throughout a structure in resonance contributors. And those are two of the only three different types of electron movements that we will see. So I'm gonna start off with those, then we're gonna look at many other examples of pairs of resonance contributors. So the first type of allowed movement for electrons is from pi bond to pi bond. You can go from being shared on one side of an atom to shared on the other. And in this case, I have just some atom X. There's a, lone, there's a pair of electrons shared on this side, but now it's shared on the other side. And I draw it from the middle of the bond to the middle of the bond. That's what that communicates. Alternatively, I could go from a shared pair to an unshared pair. We saw that up above, and I'm gonna show it again here. This you would draw from an, uh, with an arrow from the middle of the bond to directly on top of the atom, like so. And the third way that you could move electrons is the opposite of what we did just now. You could take a pair of electrons that's unshared and make it shared. So draw an arrow from the lone pair to the bond right to the right of it. And those are the only three types of electron movements that we have, but quite often we have multiples of them in a given set of resonance contributors. So I want to practice that by using curved arrows to show how the contributor on the left in each set turns into the one on the right. So this is called a, uh, this is an aromatic ring with two nitrogens in it, and I notice multiple things uh, have changed. I want to make a tip here and say, if you've got lone pairs in a molecule that aren't currently drawn, go ahead and draw them in for yourself. It'll make it a lot easier. Note we don't draw lone pairs in line structures, but we have to know that they are there. So each nitrogen has a lone pair in this case, no formal charges. We always draw formal charges, but we don't draw the lone pairs most of the time in line structures. So the lone pairs haven't moved. It's only the pi bonds that have moved. And it looks like I have a pi bond in the upper right, becoming a carbon-carbon bond on the right, a 
the same time, a pi bond in the lower right becomes a pi bond in the lower left, and a pi bond on the left becomes a pi bond in the upper left. And maybe you did that and you were like, wait, couldn't I draw those three curved arrows out of phase in the, the other directions, so to speak? And in this case, yes, you can. So sometimes, particularly for cyclic examples, there might be more than one way to correctly show how one contributor becomes a second contributor. But in this case, the one we have here is valid. Sometimes we'll put resonance contributors inside a set of brackets, really trying to highlight that it is one thing, and this is our best way of drawing it, but you don't always have to do that. Below that, we have the nitromethane molecule. To get the left structure to turn into the right, I have a lone pair on an oxygen in the lower right that becomes a nitrogen-oxygen double bond. And then the nitrogen-oxygen double bond on the top becomes a lone pair on that oxygen. Notice it's not just one arrow with this pi bond becoming that pi bond. That is incorrect because it doesn't show the change in the lone pair count, and those are also moving. You'll also notice that the formal charge changes as a result. Fc changes as a result of electron movement. The oxygen in the lower right, one bond, three lone pairs, that's a negative oxygen, becomes a negative oxygen up here. The, the negative charge, just to say, moves from one oxygen to the other. And that also highlights one useful thing about delocalizing electrons. It also delocalized charges. And nature hates charges. She does not want a charge to be bared by just one atom if it can delocalize among multiple atoms. So both of these oxygens bear a little bit of that negative charge, it's as if each of them has a one half of a negative charge instead of just one of them carrying it by itself. Right below that, looking for the changes, three lone pairs in the oxygen become two. Pi bonds have moved. So it looks like this carbon-carbon pi bond has become a carbon-carbon pi bond on the right. And then a lone pair on the oxygen has come down to form a pi bond. Now I'm always showing lone pairs and pi bonds moving from the left structure and making it become the one on the right. It's fair to say you could go in the other direction and say, could I start with this and show curved arrows how it becomes what's on the left? Absolutely, we could undo that. It would look like this, pi bond moving to the left and this pi bond going up to the oxygen. You would often not do both. It's a little confusing about which way you're drawing it, but they're both correct in this case, depending on which way you're looking at it. Below that, this is the acetate ion. So I have a lone pair on the lower right oxygen becoming a, a pi bond. And then the carbon oxygen pi bond becomes one of these lone pairs. And then the last one in this column has quite a few electron changes. Uh, one of the lone pairs on the oxygen becomes a shared pair. The carbon-carbon pi bond in the lower left becomes a carbon-carbon pi bond in the lower right. And then the carbon-carbon pi bond on the right becomes a carbon-carbon pi bond in the upper right. And when you notice, as a result, there's no longer a plus charge on the carbon. It's now on this oxygen. And this is a really interesting one. This particular example has many other resonance contributors that we sort of skipped over. Sometimes can, uh, a structure will have more than just two resonance contributors, and we will see plenty of that all year long to explain how molecules react. So what I'd like you to do is recap those five, hit pause, and see if you can take a look at the other five and draw curved arrows to show how the species on the left becomes the species on the right for each one. Okay, let's see how you did. So if I fill in my lone pairs, this is called an enolate. There's three lone pairs in the oxygen at the top. And on the structure on the right, there's one lone pair on the carbon with a negative charge. And I know that because the formal charge communicates that. I know that a negatively charged carbon atom has three bonds and one lone pair. What are the three bonds? Oh, carbon-carbon, and then a carbon-hydrogen, and a carbon-hydrogen. This is a line structure. Those hydrogens are invisible. I have to know that they are there. So how do I draw my curved arrows? Draw an arrow from a lone pair on an oxygen down on the carbon-oxygen pi bond. Draw a second arrow from the pi bond to directly on top of the carbon atom. Below that, we get what's called an aminium ion. Uh, this has a lone pair on the nitrogen on the contributor on the right. The one on the left actually has no lone pairs. So I draw an arrow from the carbon-nitrogen pi bond up to the nitrogen, and that's it. Only one curved arrow. Sometimes it only takes one in this case. Below that, we have a ketone resonance contributor. Lots of lone pairs to look at. There's two on the oxygen on the left, but the one on the right ends up having three. Again, the formal charge communicates that to me. I have to know that based on the charge and the bonding I see around that atom. How do I show curved arrows? Just one arrow from the carbon-oxygen pi bond up to the oxygen. That gets me from the left to the right. And then here we have a sulfur. Sulfur's oxygen's uh, bigger brother. It's got three lone pairs when it's negatively charged, only two when it's neutral. 
Likewise, oxygen has two, and then three when it has a negative charge. This will take two curved arrows to show how the pi bond becomes an unshared pair, and simultaneously how an unshared pair becomes a shared pair between the sulfur and the carbon. Lastly, we've actually come full circle and we're back to the diazomethane molecule that we started with up above. Uh, this involves a nitrogen lone pair becoming a nitrogen-nitrogen triple bond and a carbon-nitrogen pi bond becoming a lone pair on the carbon. And you notice as a result, the formal charge has moved. So, hopefully that's good practice to see how we draw curved arrows when we're given all the contributors. Now we're gonna wrap up by challenging ourselves to come up with at least one more contributor or many more for these species, which we're only given one contributor to start with. So remember that I can only move pi bonds and lone pairs. Those are the only types of electrons that can move. I still need to follow my rules for bonding in terms of satisfying the octet, especially all only small nonmetals. And we're gonna try to minimize charges as we go, but the charge I have in the beginning has to be the overall charge I have in the end, because it's just a different representation of the same molecule. So for the first one, there's only one electron movement I can do. It's from pi bond to pi bond. So I'll draw an arrow from the middle of the pi bond on the right, showing it becoming a pi bond on the left. And remember, you separate contributors with that double-headed arrow. When I redraw this, I now have that contributor. As a result, there is no longer a plus charge on the left here. It's now all the way on the rightmost carbon. You might be going, wait, couldn't I also let me redraw it, start with just this electron movement. That is an allowed movement. Remember, we can go from a shared pair to an unshared pair, but if you think about what that would look like, you would have a lone pair and a negative on the central carbon, and then a plus on the other carbon, and it doesn't make sense to separate all these charges when you don't have to. It is a valid resonance contributor, but it's a pretty minor contributor as a result. Below that, we actually have one we've seen before, that's the enolate from up above. I'll draw a double-headed arrow and we can take a lone pair that's shared, uh, that's actually unshared on the, on the lower right, and have it become a shared pair in the lower right, and then take that pi bond and move it up to the oxygen. That would give you a carbon-carbon pi bond in the lower right, carbon-oxygen single bond up there, extra lone pair on that oxygen, negative charge on the oxygen, and that's the other contributor. And then C, there's actually two other contributors we can draw for this one. First of all, you can take the pi bond in the upper right, and have it become a pi bond in the upper left. As a result, the plus charge is now on the other side of the ring. There's actually one more you can do. You can take the pi bond in the lower right and have it become a pi bond on the right-hand side of that ring. And as a result, the formal charge has moved to the very bottom of the ring. So sometimes there's more than just two contributors. Okay. So to wrap this up in the last minute, let's just look back at all the pairs we've drawn and see if we can figure out what the major contributor is. Sometimes the contributors aren't all equivalent in terms of which one looks most like the actual structure. There's three things to keep track of. Number one, you want to minimize the charges. So if you can have a structure that has no charges, that's way better than one that has any charges. Number two, you want to satisfy the octet on all the atoms. Three, if you have an anion, it's either going to be on the more electronegative atom if you're talking the same row of elements, or it's going to be on the larger atom if you're talking about differences going up and down a column. And we'll see that in a couple of examples. Look at the ones all the way on the right in the second batch of problems we did. So in letter B, considering these two contributors, we've got a negative on an oxygen versus a negative on a carbon. If I had to pick the better contributor, oxygen and carbon are in the same row. So I'm thinking about electronegativity, and oxygen is more electronegative. So O is more electronegative. Now remember, the true structure looks like some hybrid between the two, but it probably looks more like the one on the left. That's the more major contributor as opposed to the one on the right. That's the point of talking about this. Right below that, the aminium ion. Uh, here we have a cation. And when you're looking at cations, usually you're looking for the one that satisfies the octet. Turns out the structure on the left satisfies the octet. The structure on the right does not. The carbon is currently not satisfying the octet. Or on the left, everything is satisfying the octet. Below that, easy pair of examples. The one on the right is worse because it has charges. The one on the left has no charges, and you want to minimize formal charges. In other words, get rid of them altogether if you can. 
Uh, below that, we have a sulfur with a negative versus an oxygen with a negative. So here we're going up and down the periodic table column, and you'd rather have a negative on a larger atom. So the one on the left is the major contributor. So larger atom. And then lastly, back to the diazomethane molecule, uh, we have a plus on an N versus a plus on an N, no difference there. A negative on an N versus a negative on a carbon. A carbon and nitrogen are in the same row, so I'm thinking electronegativity. So I'm thinking the one on the left is the major contributor because N is more electronegative. Okay. So that's how we figure out which contributors are more significant when we're looking at multiple sets of contributors for one residence compound. There's only three types of electron movements you can do, shared to shared, shared to unshared, or unshared to shared. And you only ever move pi bonds and lone pairs when you look at different residence contributors for a structure. Thanks for watching.